so the um, readings actually, the readings don't always go well with our catechetical topic because we choose our catechetical, catechetical topic by month and we need to cover certain topics throughout the year from the catechism. Um, but November is, for us ends up being the kingdom of God um, and today we got a story about the kingdom of God and actually next week we'll get a story about the kingdom of God and then I mentioned you the final exam on who's going to the kingdom of God is uh, on the 34th Sunday in Ordinary Time. So um, the, it's this concept of the kingdom of God, for those of you who've been in the program um, for a couple of years now, know that it's the topic that Jesus speaks about more than any other topic, which is amazing to me because when you look at what we teach traditionally, in our catechetical programs and in our books and everything like that, the thing we teach the least about is the kingdom of God. And I know that only because I can say, parents, tell me everything you've ever learned about the kingdom of God. And we're going to have pretty good silence, right? Um, most people have not been taught specifically about the kingdom of God, and that I always find fascinating because, as I mentioned, it's the topic that Jesus speaks about more than any other topic in the four Gospels. This idea of, of something of God's world that is here among us, as we're told, the kingdom of God is among us, but it's not yet. It's not in its fullness. Most people, when they hear kingdom of God, they think heaven. Nope, that's not what you, Jesus was talking about, a reality that's here right now. The kingdom of God is here, Jesus tells us. But meanwhile, then, we look around and we say, oh, you know what, I, I don't see the fullness of the kingdom of God. To which Jesus says, yes, it's in process. But it is here. So I always struggle with that, quite honestly, all the way until I got into college. And I challenged one of my professors and I said, you know, how is this that it's here but it's not yet? And he said, the best metaphor that I can use is the idea that the kingdom of God for us today would be like a puzzle, a thousand piece puzzle. If I take the box of a thousand piece puzzle and I say, here's the puzzle, folks, and I put it down and I say, is the puzzle here among us? You're going to say, yes. Hopefully you're going to say, yeah, because the puzzle's here among us. Is it finished yet? No. Do we have work to do with it? Yes, a lot of work to do with it. Everyone's going to have to get some pieces. We're going to have to figure out what the outside looks like and then do colors next to each other. We're going to have to work together. If you've ever done a puzzle, I always think that's fun for a child to do. You know, get start with simple puzzles, and when they get good at that, go to 25-piece ones, and go to 50-piece ones, and then they're going to see that the more that they, and we always used to do this on vacation, we'd start, we'd get a little, you know, uh, maybe a 100-piece puzzle, and my wife would start it before we got on vacation, and where we were going to be for a week, and then she would invite everybody to spend some time after dinner, and we had to work together because we had to be able to do that. And it was always a good lesson, uh, I always felt, on the kingdom of God as well, because that's why it's all about relationship for Jesus, because we're gonna have to figure out what your puzzle piece, where it goes, and you're gonna have to figure out where my puzzle piece, and help me figure out where it goes. Because it's among us, and by all of us having it, it's important, but it's not here yet. And that's, the, that's this concept of the kingdom of God. But one of the things, and I've mentioned this before, that I'm also very interested in with regard to Scripture, is the fact that there's one line that the Gospel writers record Jesus as saying more than any other line in all four Gospels. There is one phrase that Jesus is remembered as saying, which I think is even more important. Remember, it's not... Did Jesus say that line more than any other line? We don't know. It's just what people remember them as saying. 
That's pretty strong because that means that when four different gospel communities went to write their gospels, they all seem to come up with Jesus remember or remembering Jesus as saying this line more than any other, which means it must have a connection to our faith life. And does anyone know what that line is? Be not afraid. Fear not. Be not afraid. That fear and faith are on the same scale. When fear goes up, faith goes down. And when fear goes down, faith goes up. You follow me? Always remember, if I happen to make any sense at all, give me a little bit of a nod, you know. <laughs> Otherwise then, you know, the relaxed listening face of an adult is, and that's why people are petrified doing public speaking, because when you're looking out at people going, that's hard to talk to, right? So you get that idea, right? That fear and faith are connected. Um, we're, I'm very fearful living in our world today, right? I don't know how we cannot be. There's a lot to be afraid of, but Mark Twain has a line. Most of us will fear that which never happens to us. It's a quote by Mark Twain, the writer. Most of us fear that which will never happen to us. Most people fear the things that then end up not happening. Now, could they happen? Yes. But think how much time we spend being afraid of it. That's a lot of energy. It's a lot of energy being afraid. In fact, God says, I'm with you. We got this. The way you learn how to get up is by falling. Fear not. Be not afraid. Fear isn't helping. Fear is an emotion that can, God, like I'll be honest with you, I never go myself or with my family into New York City without taking some precautions, right? I always want to know who's around me, I'm always looking and paying attention and everything like that. But I don't allow the fear to not have me go into New York City. Some of my best memories with my children were that we took a trip every year on the train, which when the kids were little they loved coming from New Jersey on the train into uh, Penn Station, and then we'd walk up to Rockefeller Center to see the big tree, as, as my second son said, though, when he was old enough, and we're going to see the tree, and my oldest son is like, it's huge, it's this big tree. But my son put it in context because he looked at the big buildings around it, and then he looked up, and, and, and the great line in our family is that my son Kevin went when he was first aware of it, you know, the first year that he actually was able to pay attention, and he looked and he goes, it's not that big. You know, um, what a great line. If you ever saw the tree just out on its own before they cut it down, it's humongous, right? But in, in fairness, when you see it compared to all those tall buildings all around Rockefeller Center, you know, it's not that big. He, he was right, you know, but that's always our line. Yeah, that tree, whatever the tree is then on or anything about the tree, we'll always be texting in our family thread. Yeah, it's not that big, um, but it is. And, and I remember those were great trips in there. But yes, we want to be sure you're holding my hand. My wife was holding, right? We take precautions as a result of fear. And there's nothing wrong. Fear is an emotion. We're never getting rid of it. But what we have to look at is what is it doing to our quest for the kingdom of God? See, if it's robbing us of joy, fear is too much. Which is why Jesus says, you know, when they're going, we, we're going into Jerusalem. And the disciples are like, no, they're going to kill you when we go in there. We can't go in there. And Jesus says, be not afraid. We're going to Jerusalem. It's Passover. That's what we do. We go to Jerusalem. Let's go. And whatever's going to happen is going to happen. But, and they make the trip to Jerusalem several times in the Gospels. And nothing happens to Jesus until then, the last time. Obviously, when they go in then, and then they do capture Jesus, but Jesus is fully prepared for it. He's not fearful of it. He says, yes, I'm going to spread this message of love everywhere I go, including Jerusalem. Why wouldn't I do that in Jerusalem as well? So I think fear is one of those things 
that even when we look back at, at the Hebrew scriptures, the number of times, and I gave you just a small sampling on the sheet there, on the next two pages, all the scripture passages that make mention. You can see, as a matter of fact, I remember one professor saying, when you can't think of how many times the whole Bible says not to fear, it's more than 365, which means you could do a different passage on not fearing every day of the year. That's how I remember, you know, I don't remember the exact number that don't fear is in the whole Bible, but in the gospel, it's the line said by Jesus, or recorded Jesus, by Jesus saying, more times than anything else. We don't ever want fear to rob us of joy. If you're familiar with the, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, great, uh, I don't know whether it's Disney or uh, Pixar or whoever it is, but uh, Finding Nemo, uh, the cartoon is really, it's a very, very good, has a really good message for everybody in there. And the father is so fearful of losing Nemo that he says, Nemo can't do anything. To which, of course, the funny character um, in there says, well, if he doesn't do anything, then he's not going to do anything. You know? Then he'll never do anything. So you want him not to do anything, but then he'll never do anything. You know? And when you say it that way, you realize, no, we can't keep our children safe by not having them do anything, then you're robbing them of their opportunities for joy, which we can't do, which means that there's risk involved, which is why we have to believe in a God who is with us, Emmanuel, the term that we'll be hearing as we head into Christmas. Emmanuel actually translates into God with us. That's why we'll hear that used so much, Emmanuel. It's God with us. That's the message of Jesus Christ, that God is not up there, out there, over there. God is with us, here, now. So the real issue God wants us to wrestle with is where we go when we fear, what we do when we fear. If we're not going to God with our fear and surrendering it to God, it is going to eat us up. And uh, we need to recognize that our God is more powerful than fear. Our God is more powerful than fear. I, I was very amused by a Cornell University study that I included on the third, bottom of the third page there. Cornell University did a study that I found fascinating on fear and worry. They conducted it and followed people over an extended time and discovered that 85% of what people worried and feared about never happened to them. 85%. So they asked them, what are your fears? Oh, that this will happen, or that this will happen, or that this will happen. And then they followed them over, have, have any of those things happened? Have any of those things happened? And they followed people over, I forget what the time period was, but it was an extended, fairly extended period of time, 25 years I think it was. Something like that. And it turned out that 85% of what they worried about or feared never happened. But there's even more to that. Of the 15% of the fears and worries that did come to fruition, 79% of the time, those people handled those problems better than they thought they would. They even reported learning something valuable from the experience of, that happened to them that they were fearful of or worried about. So when you do the math, you find that there was nothing to worry about fully 97% of the time. But I don't think we live that way, again, because our society, and not that I, I'm not a, what's called a dualist, right? I'm not one of those people who says, the church world over here is great, and the regular world over here is horrible. No, that's not the story of creation. God created it all good. And then people misuse creation in order to make it bad, a bad experience for people. But it's not designed that way. 
So we don't want to ever say, oh, the world is good, the church world is, oh, the world is bad, the church world is good. And that's not true either. Because sometimes the church world doesn't work out for people. So we never want to be what's called dualistic and, and separate like that. And that's and I think that that's a good reminder then when we when we're looking at fear and worry uh, that we recognize that it can it can be good that what we're experiencing doesn't have to be that we're fearful of the bad things happening. We can be focused on all of the good things that happen to us and realize that. We, but in our society. At night, at least for me, when I go home, and I'm always amazed, if, you know, and not to sound so old, um, but, you know, when I grew up, you know, there were three stations with a six o'clock news, and then four stations that did, one did a 10 o'clock news, and the other three did an 11 o'clock news. And that was it. Where now, you can hear the, you know, you can get the news 24 seven, right? Um, and then it, even on our regular TVs, I'm always amazed. It starts at four o'clock now. Then there used to be a five o'clock news and a six o'clock news. Now there's a four o'clock news, a five o'clock news, and a six o'clock news. And then there's a ten o'clock news. As a matter of fact, I think now Channel Eleven has uh, has an eight o'clock news for those who go to bed early, I guess, right? And the funny thing is that I refer to that as they should now call it the bad news <laughs> instead of the news. Because really, all it is is to tell us all the horrible things that happened in that day. And the amazing thing is that they have to dig for it. That's what always amazes me. They have to dig for that bad news. They have to find it when they can't find it in the New York area. I'm always fascinated with that. When they report about something happened in Illinois or in New Mexico or whatever. All that means is that they didn't find anything equally as scary in the New York area, which I was looking to say, that should be good news for us in the New York area, that we have to get our bad news today from outside the New York area, which means that the rest of the people in this area experienced what I call humble goodness. How many days do the vast majority, 90-something percent of us, go through our day experiencing humble goodness. We're never going to make the news. No one's ever going to be writing up our day. No one's going to be putting a microphone in front of us to, to ask us about our day. Why? Because it lacked fear. It lacked worry. We have to be able to put that, I think, we should be able to put that in perspective for us as Christians especially as Catholic Christians, the fact that most of us in our day experience humble goodness. And that's something we should be celebrating rather than waiting for the, oh, that's such horrible news, you know. I mean, the good news, even though, you know, and I'm guilty of it, where I think we're all programmed that way now, right? We're just programmed that way. But I mean, and while I shared with you some very sad uh, news in my family, right? But then I look and I say, but my, my uh, niece's son, they just got married last May, and my niece's son was baptized at St. Vincent Martyr Church in Madison, New Jersey yesterday. So while there was a loss on that date in our family, there was also a baptism going on in my brother's family. It's his grandchild, my brother's grandchild, and, and my niece, and her husband baptized their baby in a Catholic church, which is an amazing thing in today's society, right? And I was thrilled with that good news. And we could go on and on with all the positive things. I mean, the fact that all of her, you know, my son and his new wife and my daughter-in-law's mother, the wife of the deceased of Rich, and, and their other daughter were all by his bedside, you know, when he passed last night. Uh, so there's, there's so much positive and goodness, even within the fear and sadness. No wonder then, not only is the line that Jesus says is be not afraid, but the miracle Jesus performs more than any other miracle recorded in the Gospels is blind, restoring blindness, restoring sight. Restoring sight. 
because it's how we look at things that matters. Jesus says your perspective matters. Your vision matters. So, I mean, you think about no Tylenol, no antiseptic wipes, no anything in first century Palestine. Jesus had to have other illnesses that he could have cured. And it would have, but Jesus wasn't curing illness to say, oh, that person's then going to live forever. No. Everybody, that, including Lazarus and any of the other disciples and, and apostles and everything like that, eventually died who Jesus loved. So it's not like the rule is, if Jesus loves you, you're never going to die. It's not the way that it works. In, except if you look at it from a faith perspective, yes, you're always going to be with Jesus. So then, in a sense, we really do never die. Rich hasn't died to a relationship with Jesus. It's like, on the contrary. My daughter-in-law's father is now living the fullness of life with Jesus. It's only our loss. We're experiencing loss. He's not experiencing loss. So for the Christian, in our relationship with Jesus, there is no dying, really. It's just moving from one form of life to another. As the saying goes, it's like changing rooms in the house. Because the house is God's, the universe, the heavens, everything is, belongs to God. So therefore, you know, we change from one ha house in the room to another. Where the dying only comes for those left, left behind. And we don't, again, we don't think about those kinds of faith statements that I think would be important for us to focus on and to be sure that we're not letting fear dominate our lives to the point where it's robbing us of joy. Yes, there's always risk. And as a father of four children who are now grown, believe me, I know that. You know, when my kids were going out to the parties when they were in high school and college and stuff, yes, I was very nervous and I stayed up, you know, worrying a little bit, to be honest with you, right? But meanwhile, I would then pray and say, you know what, God? I put this child in your hands. I know you love them more than I do, which is hard for me to believe. So therefore, I'd always say to my children, make good choices. Every time they went out of the house, the choices you make will shape the life you live. So make good choices. I, encourage my, I still encourage my children. When my son was headed off to a wedding in North Carolina, uh, this weekend, even though he's 31 years old. He said, Dad, I'm getting on the plane. I'm going to the wedding. I said, okay, make good choices. Because even at 31 years old, you want them to still make good choices. And he goes, always, Dad, thanks. I love you, bye. You're like, oh, you know how many times am I going to hear that, right? Um, but it's important then, because at least I've done all that I can do to make them understand that the choices you make shape the life you live. Learn from the bad choices. See, bad choices are not horrible if you can learn from them. If we can learn from them, I, trust me, I've made plenty of bad choices in my life. Yeah. But I've tried to learn from them. And my first boss was really, really helpful. The very first pastor that I worked for at 18 years old said to me, Dennis, I expect you to make mistakes. I don't want you to be fearful of making mistakes. Just do, a, do us both a favor and try not to make the same mistake twice. Great advice. Great advice. And to be honest with you, I took that to heart. And I was pretty good enough that I didn't make some of the same mistakes twice. And the ironic thing is that then once we find that pattern, we make all the rest of the choices once and we don't make the same choice twice and then those few things we do two three four five six seven eight nine right until we say how many times do i have to do this and not expect a different outcome i gotta i gotta get the, i gotta put this to prayer a little bit and, and be able to not make that bad choice because we all have those things that we just keep doing that uh you know that where we're just making the bad choice and we've got to examine it, look at it, and pray about it, and figure out, you know, how to not make it for the 14th time, right? But for the most part, 
The other things, once we learn from them, we then say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to make that choice again. I've joked with you that, you know, the first time when I was five and I reached up, we went on vacation and it wasn't, I grew up with gas stoves, you know, the, you know, the fire comes on, right? The vacation home we went to when I was young was up in the mountains and they didn't have gas coming into the house, so it was electric. So I was fascinated that the coils got so red. And of course my mother said, do not touch this ever, because even when the coils aren't red, they can still burn you. And I thought to myself at five years old, no way, can't be. When it's red or orange, it's hot. And when it's not, it's not. So of course after my mother finished cooking and she took it off and the coils weren't hot anymore, I went up at five years old and hand on there and severely burned my fingers really badly, right? And the good news, I never did that again. <laughs> you learn. Now, I had to deal with burned fingers. I had to know about ice and they were putting toothpaste on it, I remember, and God knows what else everybody came up with to try to remove the swell. And then they did all swelled up and they peeled and everything while we were on vacation. And I learned a hard lesson, but I learned it. My fingers, thank God, are still fine. And But I learned never to touch that stove again. As a matter of fact, still to this day, electric stoves can just make me a little... You know. <laughs> Even though I was only five when that happened, it still makes you think, right? Sometimes we have to learn hard lessons. But meanwhile, we're better off. I always say this, right? We learn how to get up by falling. Every negative thing can be a learning opportunity. Even if the only thing I learned was that now I can appreciate someone else who's going through what I've been through. I heard a great line, very challenging. I'm still working on it. But one that instinctively says, oh, I, actually, I believe that. But it's difficult. And it was this line. The mature Christian should actually learn to love the things they wish never happened to them. How crazy is that? The mature Christian should learn to love the things they wish never happened to them because of the fact that if you're still here learning to love it, you survived it. And that survival can be lots of positive things that connect us to other people. And the reason why I thought it was true is because I've always been struggling with why we call it Good Friday. It was not good for Jesus. Pay attention this year. When they read the Passion on Good Friday, pay attention to all that Jesus goes through. It was horrible. Most people would look back and say, that should, he should never have had to go through that. And yet we call it Good Friday. Because it enabled all of us as human beings to know that our crosses that we bear, that our God shares in that. And we're actually connected through that experience. So our church ends up calling it from our perspective, Good Friday. Because it's good for us. I've told you before that my wife is a stage 3 breast cancer survivor. She'll actually, it'll actually be 20 years uh, this summer. It's coming summer in 24. Um, and they made no promises to her other than at the time our oldest was in seventh grade. And they promised her that if she went through the surgery and the chemo and the radiation, that she would live to see him graduate from eighth grade. It's the only promise they made to her. And said, focus short term. That's all we need you to do is fight short term. And if you fight short term, you will make it to see your oldest child graduate from grammar school. Well, on Friday, 
our youngest out of four, our youngest turned 25. And my wife got to see her graduate last May from nursing school after having graduated from a four-year college two years prior to that. So she got to see the youngest graduate twice from a college, one in Virginia, one in New Jersey, not just the one that she got to see graduate from grammar school, our oldest graduate from grammar school. And as crazy as this sounds, because of what, of how that experience transformed my wife's experience in the world to a very small group of people, she actually will say, one of my greatest gifts was getting cancer. How crazy a line is that, right? Now, it's, see, but if we're surviving it, then we need to look at and maybe even learn to love those things we wish never happened to us. Because whatever that was, the fact that we're still here and we survived it will connect us to so much more as a result of whatever we survived. I don't know if that makes any sense. But I think it, what I try to do with this is to bring it full circle to be able to say, not only should we not be fearing because Jesus tells us not to fear, but we need to put it into our everyday human experience to say that there is some serious disadvantages to fear, and there's some serious advantages to surviving when bad things happen to us that we all fear might happen. Right? Um, fear and faith are on the same scale. My grandmother, born and raised here, born, lived, raised, never left Jersey City. Because she never drove. She didn't drive at all. Lived to be 93 years old. God bless her. Lived through the Depression. Her husband died. My grandfather died when she was 28 years old with two young children. My father at eight and my aunt at six. Um, and she was, she was a tough cookie. And she went to church all the time on Sundays when she was working and then when she stopped working every day. Every day she went to daily mass in Jersey City, St. Aidan's, um, down the block there. She uh, got, it had to be a church she could walk to. And she was, she was five houses down from St. Aidan's. So they all knew her, she was able to go there and she always used to have a line. She said, sweetheart, she'd say to me, if you're going to pray, don't worry. And if you're going to worry, don't pray. Because she understood that they're on the same scale. I mean, if you insist on worrying, then save your time to prayer. Because it's not going to do much good for you then, right? But if you are going to pray, then surrender. Give it to God. Let it go. Let it go, realizing that I'm going to have faith, that I'm going to fall into the 97%. You know, that the truth is, is that most of the things we worry about never happen to us. So when you think about then how much we didn't do or were afraid to do, we got robbed of the joy that we didn't do because we were afraid. Jesus says, never build in the kingdom. You're never building the kingdom of God that way. You know, better that you take your puzzle piece and see, oh yeah, no, that doesn't fit. When we used to do that, the kids would always be, can't you see that that piece doesn't belong there, right? Yeah, no, but better you put it down and recognize and say, yeah, no, that doesn't, that doesn't belong there. And see if you can't find where it does belong, right? But no fear in putting the puzzle piece down to see if it fits. You know, the more, the more we are successful at, uh, at faith, the better off our fear is going to be. <coughs> But if our fear and anxiety is high, we can be pretty sure that our faith is low. Because then we're letting, we're letting the world take over. Make any sense at all? Yes. It's an important message of the kingdom of God. Um, it really is. And I, I would dare say a practical one, too. Um, questions, comments, a snide remark, um, anything that, any feedback, a takeaway, something that you say, yes, that line make sense to me, or that thought made sense to me, or, you know, whatever it might be.
Any thoughts? I will put the heat back on, sorry. It, 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 in a room like this with the high ceilings, heat rises, so then it's one of those things where when it gets on, it's actually there, and I'm feeling like, but then as soon as it goes off, I'm like, And that idea of we're all walking with crosses, right? Nobody is going around. We can all shower nice, and I put some gel in my hair this morning. In case you didn't see, try to get it down, because the guy cut it a little bit too short yesterday, and I was like, okay, you know what I need? You know, so we can put gel in and make it look good and try to say, yeah, I'm doing it. But meanwhile, you don't know the crosses that I'm carrying in addition to the one that I shared with you. But, you know, and those, but meanwhile, I, what I do know is that every single one of you are carrying crosses here today. You came in with them, and you'll leave with them. And there'll be some added, and there'll be some removed. But none of us goes through life without our crosses. And the thing Jesus asks us is take up your cross and follow me as I carry my cross. It's shared journey. It's shared journey that we recognize that your cross matters to me because we're on this journey together, Jesus says. So if I can help you carry your cross and you can help me carry my cross, that's the whole point of Christian community. That's what Jesus tries to give us a, you know, a real clear message on, is that idea that we're, we're all in this together. And when we recognize that the real myth the real thing that we should be afraid of is the message that everybody's isolated. And that's the message we get at all, you know. I, I, I remember one time hearing one of my professors say, we all dream of the house that includes the white picket fence. And in the United States, we are, we are paying a huge price for the white picket fence that says, You stay there, and I'll stay here. It's part of the American dream. Ah, not much of a dream, I don't know. You know. My grandmother then lived with my uncle and my aunt, and they were all in three row, you know, in the house down there, and you know, uh, everybody was in each other's lives, and people thought that was, oh my God, no privacy, everything like that. But meanwhile, never shy for babysitters, Never shy for food, never shy, and my, and my wife's family was the same way. They were on the east side of Manhattan, and her, you know, my uh, mother-in-law's uh, sister and her husband and their aunt and their kids all were in the same row of houses and, uh, you know, apartments in the east side downtown Manhattan. And as a result, my grandmother, my, my mother-in-law says to me, you know, on a regular basis. And during those difficult times, no one was ever alone. Everybody was journeying. Sometimes it was just the leftovers of the one house that we got during the Depression, she said, you know. But it was, we had that connection, that journey, right? We weren't, we weren't in alone. And that's what we're supposed to be doing as Christian community. We're supposed to be in it together. That your cross is not just your cross. Your cross is an our cross in Christianity, and therefore, we should be able to pray for each other and help each other when, when need be to be able to, if I can do something to help you carry your cross, that's supposed to be the goal. Um, great, thanks. Somebody else? Uh, I've said many times, you never, you don't have to. This is me struggling with faith and knowledge and trying to put it together to present it to you. So I don't believe that my conclusions and my notes are the gospel. They're just my notes and conclusions. If you come up with different conclusions and say, actually, I think that this might work better, or that I think that God works this way, or that, that if you interpret that as this, it then means this, instead of me saying, I interpreted it as this and then meant this. I mean, you know, all we can do is try to, 
you know, get that message across, but it is from my perspective in what I'm learning and what I'm bringing forth to you. So if at any point in time it doesn't work for you, throw it out. Don't, don't worry about that. I totally get that. And you're not hurting my feelings. As a matter of fact, share it with me and maybe I'll, oh yeah, that makes more sense, you know. Um, but, sure. Yeah, um, I wanted to say that fear sells, and that's why the news and everything just gives, yeah. gives it out. Yeah. But, and that's the reason why I feel Jesus has to tell and, you know, ensure people that you do not have to be afraid because, yeah, I mean, I'm it's just you. selling, right. but that doesn't it's mean selling, that right. you need to doesn't mean that it's right. Exactly. It sells. It yeah. really does. Fear sells. sells. I mean, even when you think about it from... You're driving in the car, right? I'm driving in the car and I'm always nervous. Oh man, I hope I don't get an accident, right? Driving the car. And then traffic hits and you look up and you see all the sirens and everything like that. And there's an accident in front. You know, none of us go by like <laughs> Instead we go by, oh, look at how crashed that car is. Oh, look at the dent. Oh, look at the thing, right? It sells. It sells. It gets our attention. And therefore, if something gets our attention, you're going to monetize it. Whatever gets our attention has money following it. Because someone says, oh, if you got someone's attention, you can sell this or you can make this, you know. Which is why, you know, what I was saying before downstairs, you know, I do think applies, which is that idea of it sells to have you think you don't have enough. Because when you, if you think you have enough, you're not going to buy anything. And the world's going to be in trouble. Our economy's going to be in trouble. I remember one of the saddest messages. Because I, in the parish that I was in, we did 13 because of being like Jersey City, right outside of the World Trade Center. We did 13 funerals at our parish after 9-11. We had 13 of our parishioners died. It was a wealthy area, therefore they were in the World Trade Center. It was Upper Saddle River, so therefore um, uh, men and, and two women um, that worked in those buildings, you know, made a lot of money and therefore we're living in and our parish did 13. And I remember going in and the generosity and everything that people were sharing, do, we did all the repasts, so like when people came to the funeral then we did the afterwards handled all the food for them, they didn't have to pay for anything, we did, and then we went on to do that for every family, because then we said, if we do it for 9-11 families, well, that was, seemed, everyone was willing. We had more food than we could ever, for 13 funerals, we had more food, food than we could ever use. And we said, we could do this for every funeral in the parish if we wanted to. And families rotate, and they help, the, so you don't have to go to a restaurant, you don't have to go to anything. The parish does the repast. Oh, that's so nice. It's okay. awesome. Correct? Because they can't, yet they don't want to just say to their relatives and friends that came to their loved one, go on your way. So the parish then, everybody took a turn, and then once you've had it done, then you go and say, you know what, I want to join that team and I'll help the next time with, by baking something or doing something, whatever. It's been a tradition since 2001, a presentation still to this day, they offer the repast to every family that does a funeral there. But that was as a result of 9-11. And yet I remember then hearing a few days later, the best thing that you can do after 9-11 is to go back to your normal life and buy things. And I got the idea from a bigger picture that we had all stopped, and therefore every restaurant was struggling, every store, corner store was struggling, every everything, because we weren't doing our normal routines. And therefore our economy is built on us doing our normal routines, which is buying things. So. The message from our leaders was, you gotta go back to buying things or we're gonna be in trouble, right? Which is kind of sad. COVID was the same way, right? After a while, and everyone was just home and everything, got, we gotta go back to buying things because people are losing their jobs and losing everything because it's all in place. But meanwhile, there's a little bit of sadness in that too. That then we have to at least recognize that we are receiving pressure and fear sells we're receiving pressure to be upset with what we have. The hat's not warm enough, the glove's not warm enough, this isn't good enough, the car's not good enough, the refrigerator is making noises, it doesn't make ice anymore, I need a new refrigerator. And our whole thing is built upon buying new things. 
That's how our economy is built. But it can lead to discontent if we're not taking a good evaluation of it. And we have to recognize what sells and what doesn't sell so that we're not being sold something that we don't need, which fear sells, but we don't need it. Discontent sells, but we don't need it. We're more blessed than we could ever imagine. Yeah. You're gonna sound great about it. It's, it's like the worldly stuff, right? It's like the materials. Um, I'm 39, I lost my dad last year, and my, I look at life completely different now, because he's only 63, yep. I didn't know he was gonna die. He had an infection, got septic, and that was it, it was yep. done for him. Yep. Um, so you look at life differently, and like all these materials, it doesn't matter. It does matter, because of course, guys, if you're right. you have to you want the basics, right? But once we get the basics, we should really be so thankful that we have the basics. But then what we end up doing is that we have the basics and we'd like a little more. Like Rockefeller, I just want a little more. I just need a little more. And live the irony is that, trust me, a little more comes when you're sending out generosity vibes. See, when you're sending out panic vibes because you don't have what you think you should have that's a little extra, you're actually sending out the negative vibes and likes find each other. So therefore, you're not gonna, but by generosity breeds generosity. So therefore, when you are grateful, that gratitude ends up bringing more into your life because you're someone that's living in a way that is blessed as opposed to who wants to be around someone that's always like, oh, my life is miserable. Everything's horrible, nothing's good, right? No one wants to spend time around that. And yet, at times, we're all guilty of that. So this is a good time of year to say, hey, you know what? Let's, uh, you know, let's worry about what we have rather than what we don't have. Um, there'll always be something more that we need or we think we could have or we'd like to have that we think will make us happier. But that's a tricky game to play. Because if we can't be happy with what we have, what makes us think we're going to be happier when we have more? And trust me, I, I've worked in Upper Saddle River, and I've worked in Morristown, I've worked in New Vernon, uh, very well-to-do areas. And trust me, the prisoners there are some of the saddest people that I've ever met in my life. Because they have everything, but they believe they don't. In their mind, they're living like they don't. It, it would make you crazy. And at times I had to then offer that up to be able to say, don't judge, Dennis. Don't judge. Because meanwhile, I would like smack him. You know, come live in my house for a little while. You know, see what that's like. Drive my car for a little while. Oh, let me get your Mercedes is in the shop. You know, oh, I'm miserable. Wow, horrible is here, right? I mean, people really came to me with stuff. And I had to be compassionate to be able to say, you know what? For them, that is a real hardship. Meanwhile, I'm looking going, it's not really a hard check, but okay, you know. Because just because you have more doesn't mean that you're going to have a perspective of gratitude. You know, that's why the stories of people that win the lottery, right? There was just another one on the news recently, right? Somebody won $215 million recently, whatever, and they're bankrupt already. Because you go and you say, I'm going to buy a yacht. Do you know how much it costs to maintain a yacht? more than what we all may put together in this room, just to maintain a yacht. Because the people that work on maintaining a yacht get a lot of money. I remember Steve Harvey in an interview recently, he runs a camp for underprivileged black youth to try to give them a sense of their own worth, their own value, and what it means to be respectful, and what it means to work, uh, you know, earn, and everything like that. It was very inspirational. I saw it on a um, documentary, and it was really one of the things that blew my mind. He said, "They said you put a lot of your own money into this camp." He said, oh, "It's all my money in this camp," and they say that's a lot of money. And he looks. He says, "Let me just give you a perspective, just to landscape the camp property, because it's 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 outside. I think San Antonio, Texas. I think or something. Big big property, just to landscape." The camp that he runs costs two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Can 
you imagine that? Right? And when I look at it, I say, like, I have a little tiny lawn. And you know what? It cost me $45 to have it landscaped. You know, because I'm allergic to cut grass, so that's one of the things I don't do myself. To be honest with you, I look and say, mine is, you know, mine is a little square like that or whatever, and you want to have the guy come and cut it. It's $45. I'm, like, I'm looking at the pictures of this camp, and the camp is 100 acres or whatever. In order to mow that 100 acres so the kids can play on the sports fields and everything like that, just to do the landscaping, cost me $250,000. So what this person did is they got $215 million a couple of years ago. They just went and made a couple of stupid choices. And then in order to maintain those choices, they went da da da, and before they knew it, now they're selling the yacht and taking the money just so they can live. Crazy, right? Crazy. Just because you have more doesn't mean you're going to be happier. If you're not happy with what you have right now, having more is not going to make you happier. Because believe it or not, it's a tale you tell yourself. Having more is just going to make you more miserable because you realize that more leads to wanting more. I only have this now, what I got was more. Now I realize more is that. And more is that. It's a moving bar. It's a moving bar. It's always going. At some point in time, that's why November gives us that time every year. Just make the bar say, you know what, right now, I'm blessed. Even though I don't have everything I want, I have everything I need to be happy. God has given everything I need to be happy. Hug your kids tonight and, you know, be blessed in, in the food that we're going to eat and the things that we're going to do. That I'm able to, yeah, that I'm able to live in a world that either later tonight or first thing tomorrow morning, I'm going to get on a plane and be able to go to a funeral in Omaha in order to pay tribute and sing at his funeral, uh, you know, at, which is what the family is asking me to do. So, I mean, in a way, that's a blessing in and of itself, that I'm able to do that, and that I'm, you know, I'm privileged enough to be able to uh, express my condolences that when someone says, I need you, can you sing at my husband's funeral? I'm able to say, actually, yes, I can. And I'll be blessed in order to be able to get on a plane and go to Omaha, Nebraska. For the second time in my life, I thought one trip was going to be enough, you know, for the wedding. But here I am, you know, going back. So, um, anyway, all right, let me show you. Um, if you don't have any other questions, then uh, we're good. I do hope that, uh, you know, you, you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Um, I, I know that for some of you, this is, uh, you know, it's not native to where you're from, but... Uh, you know, it, I think it does give us, however you celebrate, that idea of being together and looking around a table and saying, yeah, a lot to be grateful for um, and a lot to be blessed about. Um, you know, so I wish you that. And then um, uh, we'll get back together in December and we'll take a look at this wonderful season of Advent, one of my favorite times of the year, um, when we look at, you know, this idea of it getting darker early and earlier, which really doesn't do wonderful things for my mental health, but I've now appreciated being able to look at it as holy darkness. I imagine it the way a parent is with a child that they're trying to get to sleep. Hopefully most of you have had that experience, right? Trying to get them to sleep when it's dark out and they need to and they don't want to because they want stimulation and they want everything like that. I imagine God is the same way. Looking going, you need to just dial it down a little bit. It's holy darkness. You know, we're, we're, I look at my children when they were like that and I, and I couldn't get them to sleep being like, my God, I'd like to go to sleep. <laughs> you know, how can you not want to go to sleep? I imagine God looks at us the same way and says, I'm giving you more dark times so that you can dial it down a little bit. That you can do things that you don't normally get to do when it's light out. See it as holy darkness. Take the opportunity to do more that you wouldn't normally get to do during the light time, when you're saying, oh, I can still do this and I can still do that. Instead, when it gets dark, most of us say, yeah, you know what? But I can write a letter or an email that I didn't get to or something that is holy darkness and look at it not as, oh, isn't it so sad that it's not light out, which is the way I used to approach it. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about that more when we get together in December. Uh, but. Uh, you know, I certainly will keep you, and I ask you to keep my family in your prayers um, as well. Uh, it's been a tough journey for my uh, daughter-in-law and her family uh, because he, he was diagnosed with cancer 12 years ago. 
So he fought for 12 years until, and his goal was to walk his daughter down the aisle. So that happened, um, and he did that six weeks ago. Uh, but then his decline, as soon as he did that, was just tremendously rapid. Um, uh, so I ask you to keep my family in your